thanks for coming to, I guess, what is the very last slot of this conference. Um, I was supposed to be here on Tuesday, but I couldn't be, so I'm glad to be here now. Um, I'm going to talk about NASA Harvest specifically, but more broadly, um, the last kind of 50 years of remote sensing of agriculture and where we're going next. So I always love this image. I think it's very cute. Remote sensing of agriculture really is nothing new. Um, in fact, when ERTS-1, which is you know, now known as Landsat-1, was initially launched, it coincided with a major geopolitical event, which is known as the Great Grain Robbery. Um, long story short being that uh, we sold our wheat and corn to the Soviet Union at subsidized prices, not knowing the extent of a global grain shortage. And so when it was time to purchase our, our grain in return from the Soviet Union, they, they sold it back at a huge premium because there just wasn't enough global grain. Backfired, prices went up like 30%, cost the government, US government, $300 million in lost revenue uh, and another $300 million in what they had to pay extra to buy the grains back, or in the subsidies, I mean. Um, and that was right here, uh, right when, very shortly after Landsat 1 was launched. And so there was some studies in the kind of late 60s that weren't satellite-based remote sensing, but were invest, uh, investigating multi-spectral cameras and things like that. And by the mid-70s, there was some optimism about what remote sensing of agriculture could do and would do into the future. So here's a, here's a snippet from a first manual of remote sensing. Satellite remote sensing will eventually enable man to differentiate crops and evaluate farm practices on an automated basis with little to no human intervention. And I think uh, anyone who knows about sort of the history of remote sensing of agriculture is we've only very recently even gotten close to, to being able to do this rather than it happening early on. So why was that? There's a couple reasons, really briefly, I think a lot of people probably know this, but insufficient temporal resolution. Um, you c crops change meaningfully within about a week. Um, and we, so if you're tracking kind of crop progress, crop condition, you need to be able to construct a time series uh, that shows you what's happening there. And, um, you know, historically, if we, we're lucky enough to have two landsats in orbit, at best, you're seeing an eight day return on the overpass to a location. But with 250 daylit scenes actually being collected um, for mo most of the Landsat era until about 10 years ago, uh, you weren't getting a whole lot of global coverage. Um, and this down here actually shows you what the revisit looks like between two Landsats and two Sentinels. It's about three day uh, temporal resolution. And this is really only what we got this or last year. Um, and so when you factor in cloud cover, we've really only recently gotten to the moderate resolution capabilities um, to see these meaningful changes in biomass and crops. So I was talking about uh, the temporal resolution issue as well, so or spatial resolution, excuse me. There was This was also insufficient for a lot of agricultural regions. Um, it was useful in some places where you had very uh, large croplands, but you can see here that the early um, multi-spectral scanner before we got into the thematic mapper enhanced thematic mapper and, and OLI era, um, you know, you're kind of overlapping the edge of fields even in these large agricultural systems. And as you get into kind of more complex landscapes, you're not really able to tell uh, these locations apart. And then additionally, people, I'm sure you, there's been a lot of this at the conference, so you'll have to forgive me because I wasn't here. But we know that Landsat went through this huge era of um, especially privatization and costs the cost for data going so high that even the internal government was having trouble um, accessing the data that it needed. Um, and a lot of this changed in 2008 when uh, uh, under the leadership of Bar Ryan, uh, the imagery for everyone program was launched in 2008. And you can see the price goes down to zero. And the Landsat citations in Scopus, which you know correlate with how many projects you were able to do and how much data you were able to access, goes through the roof. And so I mentioned earlier that kind of Landsat 1 coincided with a bit, this big sort of geopolitical moment. Well, we're experiencing that very much again now. As we head into the present, everything so far was the past. You know, we've seen this double whammy, so to speak, of COVID-19, uh, climate change, and then the impacts on global food prices and food security are huge. And so um, one of the sort of UN-affiliated organizations, Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, 
was, has really been talking about, there is an urgent need for more timely, accurate, and reliable data that can inform decisions that support sustainable, equitable, and inclusive food systems. Well, what's more timely, accurate, and potentially uh, reliable due to its repeatability um, and of studies and, and duplicability than remote sensing information? And so as we head into the present uh, about a little, no, five years ago now, um, NASA Harvest was launched. This is uh, NASA's Applied Sciences Global Food Security and Ag Program. Uh, we're entering our second five years now. The first five years we were um, kind of the sole domestic and global program and now we're gonna be focusing globally. It's a multi-sectoral consortium, uh, meaning that we have people from NGOs, public, private sector, um, enabling and advancing awareness, use, and adoption of satellite EO by both public and private organizations to benefit food security and agriculture in the U.S. and worldwide. And so we've got gotten up to over 50 members now. Um, all of our work is really kind of driven by somebody asking for it. So that's what we mean when we say end user needs, somebody who's asked for the information or the tools. And we're really focused, we do have an R&D component of course, but it's really the R&D is in pursuit of transition. We're also the contribution to GeoGlam, which is a global G20 program on agriculture and food security. So what makes this kind of present moment as we head into the future a new era? Of course, we have, it's not playing. Yes, oh, there we go, now it is. Okay, so there's so much data. Um, we've got high quality science missions, Landsat entering 50 years, I mean, that's unparalleled quality. Um, we also have that complemented by private space data, which has a very high spatial resolution, and in some case, high temporal resolution, but isn't necessarily science quality just yet. And we have greater interoperability between publicly funded space missions, and also that leads to the coverage. Earlier I showed that kind of revisit diagram with the, the two Landsats and two Sentinels, that's what we got these days. We also know um, computation and methods have advanced. We have cloud computing that enables um, things to be run from really anywhere in the world, which is, is very novel because we can uh, be more inclusive and take advantage of brain power that's historically not had access. And we have new algorithms in machine learning and AI where we're learning from computer science and some of the other or, uh, domains as well. Um, I want to point out that this is the USDA NAS cropland data layer, and we have Dave and Rick in the back who have been the leads in developing this, and uh, it's incredibly valuable um, to basically anybody who's doing ag research in the US, and it's kind of a model for what we would like to see happen eventually globally. And then additionally, we have sort of broadening participation in the science. I mentioned that there is kind of a focus on pulling people in under the umbrella who have historically been excluded for a variety of reasons. Um, we also see a push toward interdisciplinarity. So um, more than us working kind of, sometimes we could be, could be uh, accused of being um, engineers with EO hammers in search of a nail, but we really have problems that we're aiming to solve. And then also taking advantage of advents in citizen science. I just saw over here there's a, a little handheld uh, spectrometer that's low cost and is correlating pretty well with Landsat, so that's very exciting. And then obviously there's urgency. We know climate's changing. We know food security is peaking, it keeps happening. We've got to do something. And so I want to show some progress that we're making in different agricultural monitoring domains. Um, and uh, all of these come from Harvest and Harvest Partners. So this is Matt Hansen's group, um, the GLAD Global Land Analysis and Discovery uh, Lab, and here's an example of uh, global crop land extent and the change between 2000 and 2019. This was led by um, Peter Potapov, and um, it's a really interesting paper if you'd like to read it. Another example, so that's, that's kind of mapping phenology. So um, with the huge crisis that's happening in Ukraine right now, that's kind of been where all of Harvest Focus has been since February. Um, and so here's an example of looking at sowing detection um, in a particular region in Ukraine. And then another example of developing global crop calendars. This is for wheat. We also did them for maize. This is actually led under the European Space Agency World Cereals Program. And I think this is a nice example of the ways in which different agencies are coming to work together and leveraging one another's funding to build critical global products. We've also seen progress in yield forecasting and estimation. 
So now at the global scale, we're able to get within three to five percent error uh, two months pre-harvest. I mean, that's huge. That's quite a bit different than what we've historically had. Subnational, eight to 14 percent error, one and a half to two months pre-harvest. And then we're even starting to show some good results at the field scale, um, combining machine learning and uh, different optical sources of data as well as synthetic aperture radar. And then also, I, I mentioned, so we have citizen science and novel data collection modalities. Um, and so, uh, and also fusing different data sources together to create better results. So um, this is Catherine Nakalembe's project. I'm so sorry I missed her. I know she was here this week. I hope you saw some of her stuff. She has this helmets labeling crops program. Uh, Street to Sat is the sort of paradigm. And it, they mount cameras on um, motorbike riders. And then they also, uh, mount them on cars. They drive through and they kind of have built this machine learning algorithm and Hannah Kerner has led that. Um, that kind of orients them correctly and then they have a machine learning ready data set to do um, crop type or crop progress, whatever it might be, um, calibration and validation. And similarly, fusing Sentinel-2 with planet scope imagery, Yuval Sadeh, he was the same one um, who did that early sowing detection graphic I showed, um, fusing planet scope and Sentinel-2 and a fused image to do daily three meter uh, leaf area index. More progress in crop and field management. So uh, down here you can see, for example, a map of 2022 fires in ag fields. I didn't include the full map here, but owing uh, to the history of observations that we have, we were actually able to map, I think the past 12 years. And it might look um, like, oh wow, there's so much burning and that's all due to the conflict. Well, that's true. The concentration around the border of the occupied territories with um, unoccupied Ukraine, there is a concentration of burning. But in prior years, there's actually quite a bit more burning because it's a way they manage agricultural land. They're not able to get out to their land for obvious safety and access re reasons. Caillou Guan, these are, both of these are from his lab, looking at crop residue fractions, uh, which correlates with uh, tillage intensity and canopy nitrogen assessment, which is useful for precision application of fertilizers and nutrients to um, select portions of the field. And then of course, this is a big one, public-private partnerships. The stuff that we've been able to do in Ukraine, um, like very detailed crop type maps at three meters at a national scale, that's really been facilitated by the relationship that NASA Harvest has cultivated with, for example, in this case, planet. Um, and we've also been working with the Institute for the Study of War and the AEI Critical Threats Project to really understand where the growing boundaries are um, of the occupation and where the areas of concern are principally. And so what's next as we look ahead to the next 50 years? Um, I'm sure you guys have heard there's a big push toward climate smart ag, sustainable ag, regenerative ag. Um, and you know, it's a worthy cause. Uh, what that really means is building resilience increasing production at the same time uh, and reducing the variability in production, that's all about the resilience. Protecting and restoring soil, water, and ecosystems. Um, so uh, fertilizer can go into water bodies and, and cause some bad stuff and topsoil loss. We're losing, I think it's about a football field every 10 seconds globally. I mean, top topsoil takes millennia or more, millions of years to grow. Losing it that quickly is really distressing. We need that for productivity. And so instituting agricultural um, practices that can restore topsoil, can reduce topsoil loss, um, that can use inputs more sustainably and also use them in ways or uh, rely on them less such that when there are huge supply shocks like we've seen with Ukraine and inability to access fertilizer, we know that those agricultural lands can still produce. And so, um, but the thing is, is the approaches need to account for the huge variability in underpinning conditions on each plot of agricultural land, as well as the human factor of who's cultivating the land. And what are their decision points? How do they decide to make a change? What motivates them? And so, uh, inspired by Harvest, we've launched this Sustainable and Regenerative Agriculture Initiative. And so it's really kind of taking the spatial thinking that remote sensing allows, but tying it to local expertise, local relevance, with the hope of making global impact in just the categories that I just described. And then also, this is a big, this is essentially what I just talked about with what we're doing in Ukraine. But building a mechanism for us to do rapid, rapid agricultural assessments for policy support, or RAPS, as Inbal, who's the director of Harvest, calls it. Um, satellite EO really fills critical gaps where we do not have information. 
and it fills critical gaps in, in kind of very low latency responses to emerging and actual threats. Um, and so two examples here are early in COVID-19, uh, in the pandemic, um, the government of Togo contacted us and was like, we need to get loans out to our farmers, make sure that they're able to cultivate, because we don't know if we're gonna have enough food to import. So we better have shore up our domestic production. They didn't know where the farmers were. They didn't know what, what had been planted in, in prior years. Within 10 days under, again, Hannah Kerner's leadership, we turned around a 10 meter crop probability map um, that in the end, once we had the time to validate, it was actually very accurate. Um, and then this is another example from when the derecho hit, a couple months later, a couple months into the pandemic, there was huge damage across major production areas in Iowa. Um, and so the manual loss adjustment actually took four months. That means the loss adjusters from the insurance organizations or from the government coming out and being like, yep, that's dead, we'll pay you this much. We were able to produce very, very, very close to that estimate um, within days um, and at a lot less than the two and a half million dollars that it took to even uh, see that process through. Um, another example, a couple years ago, uh, China completely changed their area estimates for corn and this was kind of contradictory to both history and what we knew to be the global case. So we relied on remote sensing um, as something to analyze the historical curve and also see like, really, where were we? And so um, you can see how different, for example, in um, 2016 when they made this change, their revised uh, statistics were from their unrevised and where our estimate actually was relative to that. Um, and then similarly, Ukraine again showing assessment by occupation status of these um, three major crops, rapeseed, um, wheat, and summer crops, and then um, where that is in the total crop land. And so I've taken my time since I'm the last one, so hopefully y'all are still engaged. But um, re really looking ahead, we've got 50 years of history, and it's upon us now to realize that potential, really deliver on the promise that was set out in 1972 when this whole thing got started. And so I've broken this out into sort of satellite and observation priorities, research to operations priorities, and priorities to increase adoption. And so a plea to anybody in power who's listening, we need multiple landsats. Please keep the science quality information, maybe add some red edge bands, uh, and then coordinate that long-term provision of those data. Um, we need a commitment also to the future of Landsat. We build tools, we transition them to use. Nobody's gonna wanna adopt a tool that the data source is gonna cease to exist in some unknown time frame. We need to know that these things are gonna keep being around. And as, you know, as I showed early on, we need the high revisit. We need a frequent data, we need the fine resolution, um, and Landsat's together with Sentinels are providing that, but we could do a lot as, the, as internal to the US. Um, and then also, of course, continued international co uh, cooperation on in instrument calibration and product validation. So CIOS has um, a virtual constellation that kind of tries to coordinate across all of their different satellite instruments. They have a calibration and validation working group. Leaning into that kind of thing and really putting commitments toward that can change the quality of the products, which will in turn drive their adoption. Broader and free share, broader free sharing of satellite data. Shout out to USGS, NASA for leading the way. ESA has followed suit. Canada is starting to follow suit as well. We can just keep on doing that. And then this is my own personal pet interest, which is um, sub-seasonal weather forecasts. Um, that's of huge priority um, to agricultural decision makers. And we just went out and visited with some US farmers, for example, and they're just like, what can we trust? What is good enough? Uh, like, I don't know how to trust any of this. It all seems ridiculous to me. There's obviously a very huge communication gap there as well and making sure things are comprehensible. Um, In-situ data co uh, co coordination, that would also be great. We keep finding that people are resampling the same fields in the same regions over and over again. First of all, what a waste of resources. Um, and second of all, they're not interoperable or intercomparable, I should say, data sets. And so like you can't even use them in tandem together if you could even access them all, which usually you can't. Um, and then also support for the long-term kind of research to operations programs that kind of provide that robust and reliable information. Thanks to Brad Dorn's leadership, we have harvest in place, which meant that we were ready to respond to Ukraine. What would have happened had we not been? And then uh, also some priorities to increase adoption are, as I said, the public communication of 
utilization of EO data sets and tools and the methods that underpin them in ways that are compelling, that speak to the type of evidence or the type of information that people are actually looking for. Um, open sharing of methods and lessons learned. That's not just lessons learned from the data collection, that's lessons learned from engagement, co-production, capacity development, tech transfer, field data collection, like, and the whole gamut. We could do a lot better talking to one another and capitalizing on three-year investments that tend to, tend to end without the benefits passed on to the next generation of projects. Cloud-based implementation, that's huge, overcomes connectivity and computational barriers, and then continued public-private private partnerships that take advantage or are really built upon the existing networks of the users rather than trying to come in top down and replace. Um, it's real, it should really be about complementarity. And so that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. And thanks for listening.